I'd actually like to just show you a very small excerpt from a researcher called Professor Yase Metwali, who researches Korea. I couldn't remember the last time I had After a proper yeah. night's sleep. <laughs> Didn't matter what I tried, I couldn't sleep through the night. It was impacting my whole life. I was tired and lethargic all day. I heard Flinders University had created this product called Retime. <laughs> After my leave it, I thought I was going to be stuck with this for the rest of my life. I'm sorry, we'll it's just been it. amazing. <laughs> As opposed to the hypokinetic gait, we now have the hyperkinetic gait, which we see um, what we call a Korea form gait, or Korea. With this gait, there are not only abnormalities in the gait itself, but associated movements. There can be uh, oral facial dyskinesias, in which the patient, which will be having movements of one side or the other side of the face, kind of a grimacing type of a fashion. There can be movements in the upper extremities, and there are fragments of semi-purposeful type of movements or writhing type of movements. And then the legs will also start to go. And so the patient attempts to watch in the superimposition of the move, of movements, but the patient doesn't actually fall because the bailout balance is not affected. Just you have these involuntary movements that are now In superimposed on the gait. This girl suffered damage to a small area in the region of the basal ganglia on the right side. In this slow motion picture, you can see that she is afflicted with gross abnormal movements of the left arm and leg. These are most readily evoked by emotional disturbance. Yet in spite of them, she is able to coordinate the movements of the right arm and leg and drink from a tumbler. Now, ironically, we're going to move on to brain scans at the moment. 
um, not ironically, quite appropriately. We'll go through the next one here. You can see that this is actually, um, there's quite a lot of brain mapping that occurs um, in the last 30 years. This is actually highlighting the sensory motor zone of the brain. And if we go into the next map, Jamie, the next image shows that, you know, if Jane had been beaten in this part of the head, then it was quite likely that she would have had disturbance of um, motor coordination, very close to tap the tactile and processing of multisensory information and so on. And when you, um, there are movements in science now about sensory integration, which is a different way of looking at brain function. This model of mapping isolated areas of the brain has been criticised, or it comes under criticism with different schools of thought, because of its model being about isolating functions of the brain rather than looking at the ways different parts integrate with each other. And of course, dance and music are ways um, which there's more and more research being done on the way that the interrelationship between these parts can, uh, will, some healing can take place of damaged parts of the brain through music and through dance and through movement. So Jane found herself by the fortunate circumstance of the Baal de Folle, discovering that she was healed by dancing and what a good dancer she was. And as I said before, she was nicknamed La Meninite, a form of di di uh, dynamite. <coughs> the poet Paul Leclerc described when she danced, in the midst of the crowd there was a stir and a line of people started to form. Jane Avril was dancing, twirling gracefully, lightly, a little madly. Pale, skinny, and thoroughbred, she twirled reversed, weightless, fed on flowers. Lautrec, when he watched, was shouting his admiration. Now, Jamie, if we can move through the next images. Just another, I won't move it on. So, this is one of the uh, ways that the mapping of madness occurred at uh, Solquetrier, trying to devise ways to measure madness and to document and record it, and hopefully it's healing. Uh, you can see more measuring going on there. And as I indicated before in that picture, which had Charcot with all of his audience there, he actually staged some of these events, or well, he asked his patients to stage their own um, phase one, phase two, phase three, <coughs> phase four of their hysterical fix um, to prove a point. <laughs> and then the next image. This is a... F, small f, MRI scan, which is more recent uh, scientific methodology for trying to track sensory integration processes. So as you can see, even in one image, you have several scans of the brain trying to correlate different bits of information. Jamie, if we can move on. So this is again Charcot's, um, you can see almost these stages that he's asked his, it's possibly, I mean, these are from research after the event, people uh, trying to piece together what actually was going on there at the time. So, moving on to the next, um, the next slide. Here we have Henri Toulouse Lautrec in all his beauty. Now, he did have a congenital disease. Um, it was probably through incest. And he was an alcoholic. And he also probably had syphilis by the time he died, or a few years before he died. He was um, a brilliant artist, as we know. Many of these slides are from the NGA collection, so we're grateful to we have a copyright to show them. Um, I wonder, as a performer, about the relationship between brain mapping and scientific mapping of illness and disease <coughs> and things like movement disorders versus the kind of map, well, not versus, but alongside the kind of mapping made by an artist such as Toulouse Latrie. Now, they say that uh, Lutrex and Avril's relationship was non-sexual, but they were very close friends. And as this next image shows, they were so close that he dressed up in her clothing. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was often or that was a one time, but it certainly is a good symbol of um, maybe of his understanding of her and of her understanding of him on a very deep psychological level but also on a somatic level. Their understanding of both what they overcame, but the innate beauty, the inherent beauty. I don't know about you, but in watching 
watching that movie, which was Professor Nasser's, um, uh, his research, his extensive research of different forms of career. There's a great deal of beauty in watching um, people. People are beautiful in all their quirkiness. Uh, how they suffer or how they have to live ordinary lives is another matter. Now, so we have to on redress in Jane's clothing. And if we move on to the next slide. Okay. So, brain mapping through scanning is one thing, but I believe it would be interesting to brain map to Mr. Trek's brain as he is observing and drawing a line. How quickly all the zones of his brain are working in integration with each other. There are, there's been attempts to map empathy in the brain, and it's a little bit ambiguous where it's actually located. We they know where the sensory cortex, the sensory motor area is, and the visual cortex. And empathy is probably a very, very complex conjunct of a whole lot of processes going on. But then the coordination of eye to hand and eye to heart that comes out in Henri's drawings and paintings. It is an extraordinary complex, but also a natural thing. The way we see and perceive and can observe and reflect back and accept what is in front of us. Now, the can-can, the famous can-can, and Jane O'Grill at the end doing her own thing. <laughs> Everyone turns one way, Jane turns the other. And this picture does it so lovingly, it's so simple. You glance at it and there's nothing amiss, there's nothing wrong, but here she is in her prime as a dancer and loved and one of the most famous dancers in the Moulin Rouge, and there she is. So, what is a <coughs> reckoning of Moulin Rouge without actually engaging in the can-can? <laughs>